Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard. Today I turn the camera over to you, the Hollywood Graveyard community, as we travel the world to visit famous and historical graves in your neck of the woods. We're back in Canada once again to find legends like Gordon Lightfoot, Robert Urich, Leonard Cohen, and many more. My friends, the time is yours. We've reached a pretty big milestone with this episode. This is number 20 in our viewers special series, our longest series on this channel. Pretty amazing how much ground we've covered around the world thanks to you. Episode 20 has us hanging out once again with our neighbors to the north in Canada. So strap on your ice skates and pour yourself a tall glass of Canada Dry as we explore the cemeteries of the Great White North. Good day, welcome to the Great White North. We'll spend much of our time today in Ontario. First up is the snow-covered St. Andrews and St. James Cemetery. Here lies Gordon Lightfoot. He's been called Canada's greatest songwriter, achieving international fame with his folk and country music beginning in the 60s and 70s. He has multiple gold and platinum selling records, his music described as timeless songs about trains and shipwrecks, rivers and highways, lovers and loneliness. His hits include If You Could Read My Mind, If You Could Read My Mind, Love, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and Sundown. Sundown, you better take care. Gordon Lightfoot was inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame and the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. He's considered a national treasure here. His songs can be heard in movies, from Knives Out to Licorice Pizza, and shows like Family Guy. Gordon continued to perform into his 80s before passing away from natural causes at age 84. This is LaSalle Cemetery in Sudbury, and the grave of Wilfred Shorty Green. He was a professional hockey player. Shorty was forward who played in the NHL for the Hamilton Tigers and the New York Americans between 1923 and 1927. In 1925, with the Americans, he scored the first ever goal at Madison Square Gardens. After retiring from playing, Green would coach a number of hockey teams. He lived to be 63, and would be inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1963. Also in Sudbury is Good Shepherd Cemetery, where we find the grave of another legendary hockey player, George Armstrong. He played a whopping 21 seasons in the NHL for the Toronto Maple Leafs in more than 1,000 games. For 13 of those seasons, Armstrong would captain the Maple Leafs. He would lead the team to the Stanley Cup victory in 1967. After playing, Armstrong would work as a coach and a scout. He lived to be 90 and was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1975. Next up is Hornings Mills Cemetery, where we find the grave of Erin Fleming. She was an actress who appeared in minor roles in a few TV shows and five feature films. Her best known role was as the girl in the 1972 Woody Allen film everything you wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask. In the 70s, she became acquainted with Groucho Marx, first as his secretary, then becoming his manager and companion. She would help revive his popularity in the latter part of his life, but their relationship was controversial, Groucho's family accusing her of embezzling money. Their relationship would inspire the Sidney Sheldon book A Stranger in the Mirror. Erin struggled with mental illness later in life, eventually taking her own life at the age of 61. The inscription, Hello, I Must Be Going, is an allusion to a song from the Marx Brothers film Animal Crackers, which became closely associated with Groucho. Hello, I must be going. I cannot say I came to say I must be going. For our next Canada stop, we head to St. Patrick's Cemetery here in Ontario. This is the grave of the Donnelly family, known as the Black Donnellys. They were a 19th century Irish immigrant family and victims of a vigilante mob that left them dead. The backdrop was the frontier where lawlessness and vigilantism ruled. The Donnellys established a successful stagecoach line in the area, but land title disputes and business disputes 
led to feuds between the Donnelly family and other locals. Violence erupted multiple times over these disputes. This rose to a boiling point, and on February 4, 1880, a vigilante mob stormed the Donnelly's homestead and massacred five members of the Donnelly family, including women, and their farm was burned to the ground. No one was ever convicted of the murders, and for generations, locals suppressed information about the events surrounding their deaths. The history is now part of local folklore. Their original tombstone here featured the inscription, Murdered, and was the focus of curiosity and vandalism for a while. So that was removed and this new monument placed. A movie was made about the events in 2017, and the Black Donnellys would also loosely inspire the TV series of the same name. This is Brantford Cemetery and the grave of William Ross MacDonald. He was the 21st Lieutenant Governor of Ontario from 1968 to 1974, and was also Speaker of the House of Commons in the 40s and 50s. But today he's perhaps best remembered as the namesake of Ontario's only school for the blind and deafblind, the W. Ross MacDonald School, which draws students from all over Canada. The school's motto is, the impossible is only the untried. MacDonald lived to be 84. We've reached Toronto now and St. James Cemetery. Meet John J. McLaughlin. He was a Canadian pharmacist and manufacturer who founded Canada Dry. In the late 1800s, Touted health benefits of mineral waters and carbonated beverages made them all the rage, especially when pharmacists began adding flavors to these soda waters. McLaughlin began selling soda water in the 1890s, then over the next decade or more experimented with various flavorings. In 1904 he launched Canada Dry Ginger Ale. The beverage's popularity gradually spread, particularly during Prohibition where people were looking for alternatives. Canada Dry now ranks as the most popular ginger ale brand in the world. McLaughlin was just 48 when he died from a heart attack. Also here at St. James is Laura Ryerson. On May 7, 1915, during the First World War, the passenger ship Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat off the coast of Ireland. The ship quickly sank, and nearly 1,200 people lost their lives, including Laura's mother. The lifeboat they were loaded into capsized and her mother was lost. Several were saved though thanks to the heroic efforts of Laura Ryerson. A strong swimmer, Laura would help many onto the raft after their lifeboat capsized, and rescued women of their wet clothes and helped keep them warm with blankets and provided them nourishment. Hours later, they would be rescued by a destroyer and taken to Queenstown. Laura died at the age of 51. Our next St. James stop brings us to the grave of Jerry Parks. He was an Irish Canadian actor. You fans of Fraggle Rock know him as Doc in some 96 episodes of the beloved 80s series. Jerry is also remembered for playing the bartender in the Boondock Saints movies, and made appearances on shows like Shining Time Station and Cagney and Lacey. Jerry passed away just days after turning 90. This is Park Lawn Cemetery, also in Toronto. Here we find the grave of Charles Wally Floody. He was a Canadian fighter pilot. During the Second World War, his Spitfire was shot down over France on October 27, 1941. He was captured by the Germans and held at prisoner of war camp Stalag Luft III in Poland. He and other officers held captive in the camp organized and executed an escape that became known as The Great Escape. A film based on the exploits of Floody and his colleagues titled The Great Escape would be released in 1963. He would be brought on as technical advisor. The film would go on to become a Hollywood classic. He is considered the real-life counterpart of the film's fictional character Danny Tunnel King Valinsky, played by Charles Bronson. Lieutenant Floody lived to be 71. In our last Canada video, we made a stop here at the Toronto Necropolis to find George A. Romero. We're back today to find a few more notables in these grounds. First up here is a man named Henry Box Brown. 
He was a slave living in Virginia with no access to the Underground Railroad. So, as an alternative, Henry came up with a risky but ingenious solution to gain his freedom. In March 1849, Henry crawled into a wooden box and shipped himself to an abolitionist family in Philadelphia. The crate was marked dry goods handle with care. There was a small air hole drilled into the box and he took along with him some water and a few biscuits. Brown's box was transported by wagon, steamboat, ferry, and railroad over the course of 27 hours. His arrival and emergence from the box, almost like rising from the coffin to a new life of freedom, was called the resurrection of Henry Box Brown, gaining the nickname Box for his unique method of escape to freedom. He later became a speaker and advocate for anti-slavery organizations. But with the threat of slavery and recapture ever present in America, Henry fled to England, where he began performing on the stage as an actor and even a magician. After the abolition of slavery, he returned to the States with his family, and eventually settled in Toronto, where he passed away in 1897. Also here is a man named Roy Brown, no relation to Henry. He was a Canadian flying ace during the First World War. Much debate has gone into just who it was that shot down the notorious Red Baron, German fighter pilot Manfred von Richthofen. Brown and von Richthofen were engaged in aerial combat over France in April 1918, when the Red Baron was finally shot down. Brown was officially credited with the kill by the Royal Air Force, and was awarded numerous accolades for his service. But the Red Baron was also fired upon by machine gunners on the ground, so it's uncertain exactly who struck the fatal blow. But the flying and fighting skills of Brown during this aerial combat one way or another helped lead to the Red Baron finally being brought down. He would be portrayed in film numerous times, including by Joseph Fiennes in the 2008 film The Red Baron. Roy Brown was 50 when he died from a heart attack. Moving on to Mount Pleasant Cemetery in Toronto. Here lies Lois Lilienstein. She was a singer and musician who rose to prominence as a member of Sharon, Lois, and Bram, one of Canada's most iconic and beloved children's music groups. Along with Sharon Hampson and Bramwell Bram Morrison, the trio launched their career in 1978 with the album One Elephant, Deux Elephants, which became one of the fastest selling children's albums in Canadian history. Lois would perform piano, auto harp, and vocals for the group on more than 40 albums and also star with Sharon and Bram in two television series for children, The Elephant Show and Skinnamarink TV. Lois retired from touring with the group in 2000 following the death of her husband, but continued to record occasionally and perform until her death from cancer at the age of 78. Her epitaph translates as Sweet Bagpiper. Here too we find one of the 20th century's most famous and celebrated pianists, Glenn Gould. He was a child prodigy on the piano, and would rise to be one of the great performers of classical music, particularly the works of Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and more. He was renowned for his technical precision and deeply expressive performances. Throughout his career he'd win many accolades, including four Grammy Awards, three Juno Awards, and the RIAA Lifetime Achievement Award. He was also a writer and broadcaster about classical music, inspiring and introducing it to a wider audience. One of Gould's performances of Bach's The Well-Tempered Clavier was even included on the golden record sent into deep space on Voyager 1. In 1982, just days after his 50th birthday, Gould suffered a stroke and died weeks later. More than 3,000 people attended his funeral, which was broadcast on the CBC. He was posthumously inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. The music here on his marker is from Bach's Goldberg Variations. Also here at Mount Pleasant is the grave of Pauline Rennie. She was an actress known primarily for her voice work. She lent her voice to numerous productions in the 80s, like Star Wars Ewoks, but she's perhaps best remembered today for voicing Graham's Bear and Treat Heart Pig on the Care Bears series and the Care Bears movie. Well, hello 
there. Hello, Grams. I'm so glad you could join me today. Pauline lived to be 86. We find ourselves now at Woodland Cemetery in London, Ontario. This magnificent mausoleum hosts Annie Pixley. Actors and actresses of certain generations we will never be able to experience firsthand. So it is with the great stage performers of the 19th century, like Annie Pixley, an American stage actress. She was particularly known for performing in comic operas. In addition to performing in the US and on Broadway in productions like Rip Van Winkle, Annie would also travel to Australia to perform. She was just 35 when she died from brain fever while visiting family in England. St. Joseph's Cemetery is in Orleans. Here lies Bob King. He was a songwriter and musician, known particularly in the country genre. He rose to prominence in the 50s with his hit Laurel Lee, and touring the US playing with groups like Clinch Mountain Clan and even with Elvis Presley. Back in Canada, he'd be a founding member of CFRA Happy Wanderers, performing live on radio and television. Bob is also known for co-writing with Tommy James the hit Dragon the Line. Bob died from cancer at age 55 and was inducted into the Ottawa Valley Country Music Hall of Fame. Beechwood is a national cemetery in Ottawa where veterans and many Canadian historical figures are laid to rest. In these historic grounds we find Dr. Gerhard Hertzberg. He was a pioneering physicist and physical chemist who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1971 for his contributions to the knowledge of electronic structure and geometry of molecules, particularly free radicals. Free radicals are atoms or molecules with at least one unpaired valence electron. At the time he was regarded as the world's foremost molecular spectroscopist. Hertzberg was born in Germany but fled Nazi persecution in the 1930s, relocating to Canada. Here he would teach at universities in addition to conducting his research. He lived to be 94. Resting under this gazebo is Tommy Douglas. He was the seventh premier of Saskatchewan from 1944 to 1961. He introduced the first single-payer universal health care program in North America in 1961. The program was launched in 1962, and by 1964, a Royal Commission on National Health Care recommended a Canada-wide adoption of the Saskatchewan system. Tommy died from cancer at age 81. In 2004, he was named the greatest Canadian through a nationwide vote. And you'll be curious to know that Tommy is Kiefer Sutherland's grandfather. Next up here at Beechwood we find Sir Sanford Fleming, an engineer and inventor. In the 1870s he proposed using a single 24-hour clock to standardize time for the entire world with time zones and a prime meridian. This would lead to the creation of coordinated universal time, and by 1929 all major countries in the world accepted the time zones based off of Fleming's system and proposals. So, if you live in LA but know what time it is in London, you can thank Mr. Fleming. He also designed Canada's first postage stamp, and worked with map making and railway engineering, including Canada's intercolonial railway. Sanford lived to be 88. Also here rests Philip Ross. He started his career as a journalist, becoming co-owner of the Ottawa Evening Journal. He was also a builder and sometimes player of the Ottawa Hockey Club, now known as the Ottawa Senators. Ross would be named one of the two original trustees of the Stanley Cup, Ice Hockey's championship trophy. He served in that capacity until his death in 1949, at age 91. He was later inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Making our way through the cemetery, for our last stop here we find a boulder monument to Peter Jennings. 
He was a broadcast journalist, a familiar face to Canadians and Americans alike. In 1983 he became sole anchorman of ABC World News Tonight, a role he held until his death in 2005, bringing the news of the world into people's living rooms for more than two decades. During his tenure he covered events like the Gulf War, 9-11, and more, earning numerous accolades including Emmys and two Peabody Awards. He would also be inducted into the Order of Canada, the nation's highest honor. Peter Jennings died from lung cancer at age 67. He was cremated, his ashes divided between New York and Ontario, so this monument is a cenotaph. At any rate, that's it for now in World News Tonight. Have a good evening. I'm Peter Jennings. Thanks and good night. The next cemetery on our travel itinerary is Notre Dame Cemetery in Ottawa. Here lies Yusuf Karsh. He's remembered as one of the great portrait photographers of the 20th century. Born in the Ottoman Empire, he fled to Canada during the Armenian Genocide. Here he would establish himself as a prominent portrait photographer. His breakthrough came in the form of the iconic 1941 photograph of Winston Churchill. Soon he'd be creating portraits of prominent figures from all walks of life, including scientists like Albert Einstein, writers like Ernest Hemingway, Hollywood stars like Audrey Hepburn, Peter Lorre, and Humphrey Bogart, and he even photographed Queen Elizabeth II. His work would appear on the cover of Time magazine some 20 times. Karsh passed away from complications of surgery at age 93. At Thornton Cemetery we find Dale Howardchuck. If you don't know who he is, his tombstone gives a pretty good idea. Dale was a professional hockey player, playing from 1981 to 1997 with the Winnipeg Jets, Buffalo Sabres, St. Louis Blues, and Philadelphia Flyers. He recorded 1,409 points in 1,188 games, and has the distinction of being the first player drafted by the Winnipeg Jets. He was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2001. In 2010, he was hired to be coach of the Ontario Hockey League's Barry Colts, and remained in that position until he took leave of absence in 2019 to battle stomach cancer, which took his life at the age of 57. Howard Chuck was honored posthumously with a statue outside of the Canada Life Centre in Winnipeg. This quiet rural cemetery is Church of Christ Cemetery in West Lake. In these humble grounds is a giant of the small screen, Robert Urich. He was an actor of film, television, and stage, but perhaps best known for his prolific work in television. Over the course of his 30-year career, he starred in more than a dozen TV series. These included SWAT, Lonesome Dove, Spencer for Hire, The Lazarus Man, Love Boat The Next Wave, and Vegas, which earned him two Golden Globe nominations. And his notable film roles include Magnum Force and Ice Pirates. After a cancer diagnosis, he and his wife dedicated much of their time and efforts to supporting cancer research and education. He died at the age of 55. Robert was cremated, his ashes scattered over their nearby vacation home. This monument was later placed here in his honor, and also marks the final resting place of his wife, actress Heather Menzies. She appeared in dozens of film and television productions in the 60s to the 90s, including guest spots on shows like Dragnet 1967, Bonanza, and Vegas alongside her husband. She had a regular role as Jessica on Logan's Run, and on film she's perhaps best remembered today for playing Maggie in Piranha, and Louisa Von Trapp in The Sound of Music. I flit, I float, I flee, flee, I fly. Heather died from brain cancer at age 68. Let's bid farewell to Ontario and say bonjour to Quebec. This is Shar Hashemayim Cemetery, where Leonard Cohen is laid to rest. He began a career as a poet and novelist in the 50s and 60s before embarking on a music career. He released a number of albums in the 60s and 70s before releasing what would be his most famous song, Hallelujah, in 1984. The, King the song had moderate initial success, but found tremendous popularity through several cover versions, 
including by John Cale, Jeff Buckley, Rufus Wainwright, Pentatonix, and many more. It remains one of the greatest and most covered songs of all time. Cohen would continue to record and perform into the 2000s, passing away from injuries from a fall at age 82. He would be inducted into the Canadian Hall of Fame, the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And in 2023, Rolling Stone ranked him among the greatest singers of all time. Next up is Kehal Israel Cemetery, where we find the grave of Jacqueline Linetsky. She was an actress particularly known for her voice work in animated series. She voiced the title character in Caillou and also lent her voice to shows like Tommy and Oscar, Brought and Ralph, and What's with Andy. In front of the camera she can be seen as Megan in 15 Love. But her career was cut tragically short in 2003 at the age of 17. She was traveling in a van with her 15 Love co-star when the van lost control and crashed. Both were killed and their final episode of 15 Love was dedicated to their memory. Cimetière Mont-Royal is in Outremont, and this grand monument belongs to John Molson. He was an English brewer and entrepreneur in colonial Quebec in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. He founded Canada's oldest and largest brewery, Molson Brewery, in 1786. The company continues to operate today, producing beer as Molson Coors. Additionally, Molson built the first steamship and first public railway in Canada, and established a hospital, hotel, and theater in Montreal. John was the patriarch of what is one of Canada's wealthiest and most prominent families. He died in 1836 at age 72. We're in Montreal now, and Cimetière Notre Dame des Neiges. Here lies René Angelil. He was a singer, music producer, and talent manager. He sang in a pop rock group in the 60s, then by the 70s began managing artists. In 1981 he heard the demo tape of a 12-year-old Celine Dion and soon took over as her agent, helping build the young talent's career. He continued to manage Celine Dion until 2014, helping her become one of the biggest singers in the world. Years after beginning to represent her, they began a personal relationship when she was 20, and in 1994 the two married, remaining together until his death from throat cancer at age 73. He received a national funeral service at Notre Dame Basilica before being laid to rest here. It's believed that one day Celine Dion will also be laid to rest here alongside her husband. Also here, under a fresh layer of snow, is the grave of Maurice Rocket Richard. He was another of Canada's great hockey players, playing for the Montreal Canadiens for 18 seasons between 1942 and 1960. He was the first player in NHL history to score 50 goals in a single season. He would retire as all-time leader in goals at that time with 544. Additionally, he won the Hart Trophy as MVP and played 13 All-Star games. Today he ranks among the greatest players in history and was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1961. The Rocket died from cancer at age 78 and was the first non-politician to be given a state funeral in Quebec. Also here is Jean Drapeau, mayor of Montreal from 1954 to 1957, then 1960 to 1986. He played a key role in helping Montreal attain global status. Under his administration the Montreal Metro was developed, and a major performing arts centre was built, Place des Arts. He secured the 1976 Summer Olympics and created a Major League Baseball franchise, the Montreal Expos, in 1969. Drapeau lived to be 83. Continuing east, we reach Fernhill Cemetery in New Brunswick. In these grounds we'll find two fathers of Canadian Confederation, Canada's founding fathers. The first, William Steves. In 1864 he was a delegate from New Brunswick to the Charlottetown Conference and the Quebec Conference. There the basis was laid for the Federal Union of the British North American Provinces in a new nation. Canada on July 1st, 1867. 
He was later appointed to the Senate of Canada where he advocated for better care of the mentally ill. He died in office at the age of 69. Also here we find Sir Samuel Tilley. He served as Premier of New Brunswick from 1861 to 1865, and was a New Brunswick delegate at the conferences to support Canadian Confederation. It's believed that it was Tilly who proposed the word Dominion be added to Canada's name. He would later serve as New Brunswick's Lieutenant Governor. Samuel Tilly lived to be 78. Haze and gloom accompany us to the grave of John Monroe, a fitting backdrop for a tragic tale of murder. John Monroe was a prominent architect here in Canada, but on Halloween 1868 he murdered his mistress Sarah Margaret Vale and their infant daughter Ella May. The remains of the two victims were found a year later, and Monroe was arrested, charged, and convicted. He was sentenced to death. Well known and loved in the community, his crime shocked the region. His father pleaded all the way to the Governor General on his behalf, and a petition of 2,000 people was presented. Nonetheless, the death sentence was carried out. He was hanged at the age of 30. Afterward he was cut from the gallows and his family sneaked his body here to the family plot. But his name does not appear on the stone for the shame of his crime. The Maggie Vale murder case has become part of local folklore. When death comes to my door in the end, may there be naught of fear or surprise. I would look on his face with calm eyes. I would reach for his hand as a friend. This poem was written by Anna Minerva Henderson. She was a teacher, civil servant, and poet. She began to publish her writings in the 1930s, including her sonnet, Parliament Hill, Ottawa published in 1937. She also self-published a book of poetry, Citadel, in 1967. It's believed to be the first book to be published by a black woman born in Canada. Anna lived a full century. We find ourselves now wandering Church of England Cemetery in New Brunswick. Here lies Abraham Beverly Walker. He's remembered today as the first black lawyer born in what is now Canada. Walker studied law at the National University Law School in Washington, D.C., then returned home to New Brunswick to practice law. Soon he'd be admitted as an attorney of the Supreme Court of New Brunswick and called to the bar in 1882. Walker was promised a Queen's and King's Council appointment, but racist objections prevented it. As a journalist, Walker published a magazine called Neath, which focused on issues of history, philosophy, literature, and art, making him the first black publisher in New Brunswick. He died from tuberculosis at age 57. In 2019, he was nominated to receive the Order of New Brunswick. Manitoba is our next Canada stop. This is Brookside Cemetery in Winnipeg. Here lies Jane Vesey. She was a Canadian blues piano player, best known for playing with the Down Child Blues Band. She joined the band in 1973 and would play with them until her death in 1982. The band had a number of minor hits like Trying to Keep Her 88s Straight and Flip Flop and Fly. But Jane's life and career were dealt a tragic blow with a leukemia diagnosis in 1975. She fought the disease for years, passing away at just 32. And finally, we hit the West Coast, arriving at Port Coquitlam Cemetery in British Columbia. In our previous Canada video, we featured a monument to Terry Fox back east. But well, now we find his actual grave. At the age of 19, Terry lost his right leg to cancer. Shortly thereafter, Fox began training as a marathoner and devised a run across Canada to raise funds for cancer research. It was dubbed the Marathon of Hope. That run began in St. John's in the East, mile zero, on April 12, 1980. He averaged around 20 miles a day, all with a prosthetic leg. 
He became an inspiration and national hero in the process. But Terry was forced to stop in September in Thunder Bay, Ontario when his cancer returned. That month he'd become the youngest person honored to the Order of Canada. He raised millions of dollars for cancer research before his death at the age of 22. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.